Hey guys, welcome back to another Sidecraft episode. But I have to admit, I don't have my priorities straight. In this episode, I should be working on either a shulker farm, to get shulker boxes, or finally a system to get some redstone dust so we don't have to go mining anymore. But I'm really tempted to work on yeah, a supply of decorative blocks. Because we already needed that, and a lot of time was actually spent gathering those blocks. So as you can see here, Methods was using tinted glass for the mob farm, which was definitely optional. Uh, we could have used another block just to reduce the light level, but of course, tinted glass just looks the best. And we had to, uh, our Methods had to spend quite a lot of time getting over 13,000 shards, which was required for just this build. And of course, tinted glass is something you want to use from now on for all the mob farms and other projects as well. So what we've been doing was to search for geodes in the perimeter walls here. I think only one side was really having those and spend, yeah, method spent a couple hours running around mining the shards. Uh, let me quickly find that. So it, here it is, we found a nice little cluster, five geodes, four geodes next to each other that were manually harvested. It's super worth it to do it, of course, with the yeah, fortune pickaxe. You get 8.8 .8 shards on average per cluster harvested, compared to two shards, which you get by breaking it with a piston. So almost yeah, four and a half times as much. But there's, a, of course, a couple of downsides of doing it manually. Gotta be careful to not break the budding aim assist. And of course, in the long run, a machine will always be better because she doesn't need to sleep, can run 24-7. But uh, yeah, Methods was already getting really annoyed by doing this for a couple hours to get enough shots. So the goal for today is of course to build at least one geode farm. So an automated setup to harvest the clusters. One of the first things we need to do for the project is find a good location for the geode farm. I was thinking a cold biome would be perfect because then we can also place down some cauldrons. If you have to AFK somewhere anyway, might as well get some powder snow from it. So I've been mining ice over there in a cold biome. That's a location we can go to and just search for a nice area where we can also hopefully have a lot of clusters within range. Because there's this about 128 block radius around the player where blocks are getting random ticked. Uh, if we have as many geos as possible within range of the player, we can make a faster farm. Alright, so we're searching manually for a good location by just flying around here in the cold biome. Um, using also the mini hut mod to assist me with finding a good spot, it actually displays the random tick range from a fixed point. Um, so in case you want to use this as well, it's super useful if you have mini hut mod. There's two options, so you can either display the random tick range uh, from a fixed point, that's what I'm using here. Or you can also have it dynamic. So if you have it dynamic, then as you can see, yeah, it moves around if you move as well. But it was actually more useful to find a fixed point to do this. So usually the highest amount of random ticks range of the player is at the corner of a chunk. Then I had to set a yeah, short key for that to display this year. There we go. Then you can count the amount of geodes that are within range. Technically, what would be even more useful would be an amount of budding emesis within that random tick range. A quick explanation in case you've never heard of a random tick range it's a roughly 128 block radius around the player uh, where blocks are getting random ticked. So, for example, stuff that is visible from here. There would be over there, it would be outside of that range. So if there would be a geode 150 blocks away, you can still see it, but stuff wouldn't grow. But that's why it's important it's within that box. Uh, it's a bit of abstract of a concept. And well, you really need tools to, to display it for you. Okay, so we have 14 of those geodes within that range. So that means all the crystals can grow there. Uh, actually counting those was a bit tricky. So what I did in the end was Gave myself a stack of beacons in creative, placed them down and dropped one out of the inventory. And then I was pretty sure in the end that I got every single one and I had 50 items left. That's how I counted. Okay, next step is then designing farms for this. 
um, uh, the new mob, the Alley, would actually be kind of useful to collect items for us, but it was still in 1.19.0 where we can't duplicate Alley, so we don't have access to an infinite amount. So, yeah, we're just gonna go with the flying machine design again because it's really not as horrible as making a custom design for each diode with like a piston, a stationary piston setup from. Yeah, our testing before they were LAs, the flying machine design was actually also a superior one compared to other ones. Uh, could be that the LAs are now even better because you don't need to worry about item collection as much as anymore as before. Because the LAs could maybe do it, but yeah, I basically don't have the time to look into this right now. Maybe we can try it out in the future. All right. Um, yeah, so what we do in order to design a farm was just to take a schematic. Yeah, of a geode and go to a creative world and then we can design the farm around it. Of course it's way more convenient to actually design this in creative because then you can easily remove all the blocks around the geode just with a fill command, remove all the deep slate and so on. So you only have the, the budding emesis blocks left. So let's do this real quick. Okay now we exposed all the budding emesis. Now we can design the flying machines around in that. So the basic idea is that we yeah, send flying machine through the whole geode without breaking the budding M assist. So basically just flies through this way. For example, if there's a yeah, cluster here, it would be shaved off by the flying machine. And we do this from three sides. So yeah, usually first we send one from on top. For example, this block can be taken out and so on. Then one from this side and then one from the other side. Uh, so yeah, basically would need to project all the budding emesis from the yeah, 3D space into a 2D, uh, into a 2D lane. Uh, this would be quite helpful because we basically got, got to wrap some of the flying machines around those geodes. I actually have a yeah, tutorial on my channel already, it's about a half an hour, that explains this in really detailed steps. Um, there's also tools that can help with this, but in case you yeah, don't want to use mods or install something, but it's also helpful, it's what I did, you can also clone over a slice without replacing the other blocks. With the clone command, you can select coordinates and then select the uh, masked option. So you can basically clone this slice, a couple blocks over, then the next one and so on. Then you have them all in one slice and they can easily you know, design a flying machine to wrap around this. Okay, so let's do this real quick for the geode. Okay, there we go. The farm has been fully built up. Uh, let's just try it out. It then also becomes easier to understand. So we have yeah, basically this pattern with the flying machines that gets pushed through. Okay, just gonna launch this here real quick. First we sent down flying machine from on top, as you can see. Leaves out all the budding emesis and only the clusters are broken. At the bottom we have water collection. The barrels here are non-movable blocks, so the flying machines can return safely. And as soon as this is back up, this line will be triggered and sends in this flying machine. There we go. And there's still some yeah, clusters that are left over. They couldn't be reached by both machines. So that's why we're gonna send in the third machine. There we go. Now, yeah. All the items could go to the storage. Okay, there's a little downside. Some of the shards or items are left over. The lays could also help with that. So now we could have a lay, um, either free <laughs> or in a little cage, uh, somewhere around this, so maybe up here. And once the machine is done, we could yeah, tell the lay to pick up the items. It's probably also actually possible if they wouldn't fly away, I'm not sure. Um, to have them just yeah doing its own thing without being caged in, but it probably is safer to have a cage for them. So then they could yeah pick up the items. I think there's also some here left over on the honey block of the flying machine. This could be picked up. So if an lay, this could get 
yeah, slightly more efficient. So most of the items were collected. We could maybe check out the numbers real quick. What was left over? It's not too much. Four items there. Then the ones here. The flying machine. So eight items in total. If we compare this with the total amount, um, I'll just pick it up real quick. There's probably like two stacks down there anyway. And there we go. Actually, way more than that. Uh, yeah. So that lays wouldn't help much. So what do we get? Five, six. Yeah. Almost eight stacks we got. So yeah, losing eight items really wasn't a problem. But of course, it would be a slight improvement that can be done with a lace. Of course, we're also using the 167 minute clock to launch the flying machines, because there's this dilemma that if you send a flying machine too early, then too few of the clusters have fully grown, so you don't get anything from a partially grown yeah, M assist on the side here. So only the clusters would actually give you items. And if you wait too long for all of them to be fully grown, of course, then yeah, you would also get less. So 167 minutes is the perfect clock. Then one more note, as you can see, there's also some cl clusters left over that can't be reached by any of those three flying machines. For example, um, so here we got some. You'd think if we can just send a flying machine from on top, but we basically only have two blocks of space available. So there's some restrictions for the flying machines as well. For example, all the observers need to be covered, so cluster growing wouldn't ruin the flying machines. So yeah, it would be quite tricky to access some of those blocks. But in case you really want to try hard, of course, there's always a way to do it somehow. So for example, with this one here, I'm not sure if you remember those uh, drawbridge designs from, oh my god, I, know, I remember Seth Bling made a video about it, where you could have like a slime structure being pushed in, you could knock out this block, so you wouldn't even need to use a flying machine uh, just to break this block, for example. So that Then you could even yeah, raise the efficiency of farm a little bit more in case you get creative. But since we're going to design 14 of those farms, which is the goal, I think I'm just going to ignore that. Uh, that's just too much work in the end. Already took some time here to make this one here. Here's at least a solution for the two wide gap. Um, so we could make a flying machine like this one here. that doesn't push a structure in front um, like that one does. So it's basically just too wide and it would also be self-returning. We can see. Could easily put it in there. Okay, there you go. And it self-returns up again. Mm, let me actually quickly add that. Alright, let's try it out. So now we also have one flying through there. Neat. <laughs> but still, of course, we didn't get all of them. Okay, so let's head over to survival and build this. You're probably also wondering, I don't think I explained it, why we're using barrels. So it's, of course, a non-movable block, but why not obsidian? Uh, obsidian, of course, would be even better, but we don't have a huge supply of it. So we don't have a gold farm for bartering or a dedicated obsidian farm. But that's why we're using barrels here. It's really a cheap block, only requires yeah, logs, which we can get from a tree farm. And it's the better option compared to the furnace, because the furnace does get ticked, unlike the barrel. Um, and yeah, it's also still better than a dropper, because that requires redstone dust. So for us, best option right now, because we don't have a lot. Uh, and I think it actually looks pretty nice as a wall decoration. This doesn't look bad at all.
All right, there we go. So a farm like this one here, which is already using a rather large geode, would make around 170 shards per hour, which actually is not much. I mean, in order to get the amount of methods needed for the creeper farm, for example, we'd need to AFK for three entire days at this farm. Oh, actually, a block got stuck here. Yeah, three entire days at one farm. Um, so that's why we decided really to build 14 of those, which actually got done. So time for a progress update. It's a couple of days later, not only do we have one, we have 14 now. They're not completely finished, but we can already check it out. It's only a couple of details are missing. I was thinking might be best if I actually show this in free cam. So there's a couple of tunnels that actually connect all the farms right now. Yeah, with numbers, there's farm 9, 10, you can see another one that probably was just launched. Yeah. <laughs> so here's one more. Yeah, let's go to free cam so we can see them all easily. So there's one more. Here we got a farm. So of course a lot of Psycrofters helped building this the last yeah, couple days. And what we also have is already like a central storage. But I want to decorate this a bit more at some point. Um, so as you can see here, all the water streams also link to one farm. All the outputs join up here. We can maybe just follow the water stream real quick. Go up the bubble elevator. Yeah. And they end up in the collection of the, the first farm here. And yeah, then everything goes to this double chest. Um, where am I right now? Let's go back. This double chest was cleared yesterday. Let's see what we got. Oh, only three striker boxes. Maybe somebody else cleared it. So technically, without having really precise numbers right now, we should get something like 2,000 to 2,500 shards per hour, uh, which is enough to craft 1,000 to 1,250 tinted glass. Um, so that's not a lot. It's not a lot. Um, well, this is definitely a good start. So, <laughs> normal project can be definitely be yeah, accomplished by those farms, but we might need to look for a bit more in the future. Um, definitely a better spot for this. So I actually counted the number of budding emissors that we have in reach um, of the AFK player. It's 467. Now there are already a couple tools online as well that search for a better position. Um, I was thinking, I was trying around with that already. So I was thinking I'm not gonna show this in this video, I'm gonna make a separate video showing you how you can find a better location. Um, so I already found a spot that has 1130 budding emesis within reach of the player. That's almost two and a half times as much, so we can yeah, squeeze twice the farms uh, within the range and, and just get a lot more from a single region as well. So yeah, I'm gonna make a separate video explaining how to use those tools in case you wanna do a similar project at some point. Just wanna use a ton of tinted glass. The AFK spot of the farm is also high up in the sky here. Um, so not down at the geodes really. There's yeah, a couple advantages in case the mob switch would be off. You don't have any hostile mobs spawning. So each hostile mob, of course would add a little bit of lag. And for the same reason, yeah, we are high up here. For example, yeah, squid spawning, fish spawning, glow squid and axolotl spawning is also yeah, not disabled, but we don't have any of those mobs around that would add lag because we are so far up. Um, so those mobs would then yeah, not spawn at all or despawn. Um, so that's the reason why we're high up here. And yeah, so we got almost 14 working farms, so we need to do a couple of details. Um, the project is not done yet, I still want to decorate this a little bit. So I want to have a nice like uh, platform up here with an elevator to get us up there and a nice control room where we can have one central clock and maybe a nice uh, central storage. So this will be added, but I feel like I'm having a bit of pressure right now to work on the next project because I'm already kind of procrastinating working on a redstone dust supply. And this is definitely more urgent than yeah, decorative projects at the moment, but I'm definitely gonna come back to this. All right, time to wrap up the episode, but I wanna talk about one more topic again, 
which were the rates of this dude farm complex. Actually miscalculated how fast this would be because when yeah, the dude farm mechanic was first introduced, for a cluster that you harvested with a piston, you got four shards on average. And this was later reduced to two shards. If you harvest with a fortune pickaxe, you get 8.8 .8 on average. So about four and a half times as much. So it's definitely worth it in case you just need a little bit to do it manually. But it's of course also the downside that you might break a budding emesis and so on. We've been running this setup now for over a week. Got a couple 10,000 shards. So in case you really need a lot, then definitely automatic farm is the way to go. But yeah, it's a bit unfortunate that Mojang actually had to nerf those geo farms. So considering all the effort it took to design 14 farms, excavate around the geode and then build the farms. Yeah, we're getting, didn't really measure it accurately yet. Getting closer to 1000 shots than 2000 shots per hour which is yeah, actually a little bit sad. So Mojang's balancing sometimes is a little bit odd trading villagers, everything for one emerald. So basically you can exchange one co one carrot for yeah, enchanted uh, armor and tools. It's fine apparently. That's not too OP and, or raid farms. It's just ridiculous, no effort and yeah, multiple useful items can be gathered within like the first day of playing. That's all fine. But those geo farms, yeah, they were too overpowered apparently and had to be nerfed. Yeah, sometimes a little bit odd, but well, you can live with it. Just have to <laughs> put in a little bit more effort to get um, yeah, an amount that we're comfortable with. So the plan is definitely to either add yeah, a second complex like this in a better location or just actually at some point make a like a multiplayer location in a perimeter where we then go all out, maybe have 50 geos within a range of a couple of players or something like that. Alright, but for now, this definitely helps. If you need to build tinted glass, we can, but it's not like we could <laughs> make perimeter walls out of tinted glass or something crazy like that. Alright, so that's it for today. Thanks guys for watching and see you next time. Bye bye!